what's up guys welcome back to my youtube channel once again my name is dash lifestyle kindly for watching me for the first time remember to subscribe like share and also comment to my returning subscriber thank you so much for always coming back and watching my video thank you so much for the love and support and greetings greetings to my brothers and sister all the way from caribbean country so guys in today's video i want us to talk about white rage in united states and also i want us to talk i want us to watch this video from a black professor she goes by the name carol anderson carol anderson she has come out and exposed how the black people they are being treated in united states how the black people they are going through racial discrimination in united states so kindly guys watch this video then i'll be back with more comment first let me just say thank you it is so wonderful having you here today. It is wonderful being honored with the John F. Morgan Senior Distinguished Faculty Lecturer. And it is wonderful to be at Emory. I wanted to talk about white rage. And I know it sounds crazy, but let me talk about how a black woman got to white rage. <laughs> <laughs> and although it looks like it began with Ferguson, actually it began in February. 1999, when a black man came home from a hard day's work. And he went home, got into his apartment, and realized there was no food. You know that when you come home, you worked hard, you look in the refrigerator, and the refrigerator's looking back at you. <laughs> <laughs> and there's that moment where he's just, and he's like, oh, but he's in New York. And you know New York, the city that never sleeps. So you know there's gonna be food available. So he goes outside, he steps on his apartment, you know, the, the porch, and whew, a car ro rolls up. Four officers of the NYPD hop out, guns drawn. 41 bullets later, Amadou Diallo goes down. 19 of those bullets hit. Amadou Diallo was unarmed. He had committed no crime. There was no warrant out for his arrest. He was just a black man in the Bronx. Now, that is bad enough. But then I'm watching Ted Koppel's Nightline and Mayor Rudy Giuliani is on. And Giuliani is just unrepentant. And Ted Koppel, as you know, is not a softball interviewer. And he is on Giuliani. He's like, Amadou, Amadou, Amadou. And Rudy's like, what? He barely says the man's name. What he does say, my policies are working. New York City is safer now than it has been in years. And he pulls out his little flip charts with a little graph showing crime going down. My policies are working. New York City is safer. And I'm thinking, it's not safer for Amadou. Safer for whom? And the policies that he's talking about it's the broken windows policing policy. That broken windows policing policy basically hyper polices black and brown neighborhoods, criminalizing black people, criminalizing brown people. You jaywalk, the cops are on you. Drop some litter on the ground, cops are on you. You're standing, cops are on you. You're walking, cops are on you. You are getting ready to step off the curb. Cops are on you. That hyper-policing is the policy that Mayor Rudy Giuliani said was working. And while he talked about it, he said, and my police force is the most restrained and best behaved in the United States. I'm in Kafka land right now. <laughs> you know where, where Gregor Sampson is this big cockroach, but everybody's acting like it's normal, right? <laughs> you know, because I'm thinking most restrained and best behaved don't fire 41 bullets at an unarmed man. 
I know something is wrong, but I don't know how to name it. And you know, we have to name things in order to be able to face them, to be able to deal with them. And so I don't know what to call this thing. And I'm just going, Ugh. But as a scholar, I keep writing, I keep researching, I keep thinking, I keep teaching, I keep writing, I keep researching, I keep thinking. And then in August 2014, I'm at, in my home office and the TV is on. And I look up, who and Ferguson is on fire. I mean, the flames are everywhere. And it didn't matter. I had the remote in my hand and I'm flipping the channels and it didn't matter. Let me see my left hand. It didn't matter if I'm MSNB, watching MSNBC. Yeah. CNN. Or Fox. <laughs> Out this door. <laughs> um, <laughs> it didn't matter. And it all said the same thing. Look at black folks burning up where they live. Did you know that black people were burning up where they lived? Black folks are burning up where they live. What is wrong with black people? Burning up where they, who burns up where they live? Because one of the things you begin to understand is that America needs the narrative of black pathology. You know, everything would be fine if only black folks would. Right? We've heard this. And then you begin to fill in the blank. If only they would value education. If only they would not be thugs. If only they would. You fill in the blank in terms of that black pathology because that is absolutely necessary in the narrative of America. And so there I'm watching MSNBC, CNN, and Fox all with the same narrative of black pathology, this black rage they're talking about. Well, I'm sitting up there and I'm shaking my head. You know how you're shaking your head like, mm-mm, mm-mm. And then I realized I'm looking shoulder to shoulder to shoulder to shoulder. I'm shaking my head so hard. And I said, no, this is white rage. So guys, I hope you have watched that video from our black professor, Carol Anderson and for me I think she has done a very good job by teaching us and exposing what it is happening in the United States. The black people they are going through a lot in United States. Black people they are facing this white rage in United States. The system in the United States it has designed to oppress the black people. The black people whenever they are trying to rise these white folks they are trying also at any cost to bring them down so this means that these people they don't want to see black people uniting these people they don't want to see black people fighting their own rights in the united states they don't want to see black people having more privilege than them in the united states and this it has been gone for a very long time until now it is also still there the black people they are having less opportunity the black americans they are uh, they are being oppressed by the white folks till now Ooh. Ooh. this is white rage i had lived in missouri for 13 years i saw the way that policy worked i saw the way that policy systematically and systemically undermined African Americans access to their citizenship rights. But as a nation, we were so focused in on the flames that we missed the kindling. That kindling, let's talk about some of that kindling at Ferguson. Kindling. 67% of Ferguson's population is African American. In the 2013 municipal election, the black voter turnout rate was 6%. How do you turn 67% of the population into 6% of the voters? Those are numbers from Jim Crow, Alabama. You do it via a series of policies, the ways that you hold your elections, the ways that you craft your ballots. There's a whole series of tricks that you can use to change 
into six. Kindling. Because you begin to think about what it means if you don't believe that you even have a say in who your representatives are. Kindling. Let's talk about the schools. Michael Brown school system. Missouri rates its school systems. It, it accredits them on, on a 140 point scale. Graduation rates, uh, matriculation rates, test scores, the whole nine yards. And you can get a total of 140 points. How many points do you think Michael Brown school system got? How many? On 140. Hey, 20. 20. That's a good one, Eric. <laughs> That's a good one. 20 out of 140, right? Any, anybody else? 10. Ten. Whoa. Aren't <laughs> okay, I believe that's called cheating. <laughs> 10. 10 out of 140 points for 15 years. What that means then is that the public policy leadership was very comfortable with pulling an entire generation of black children through a school system that could garner no more than 10 points, an entire generation, and then start pulling another generation through because we're at 15 points from K through 12. Kindling. Kindling, let's talk about the police. We know that the police are here to Protect and serve, yeah, because I'm going to be doing this throughout because there's a kind of hymn book that we sing from, right? <laughs> we know, right? We know. The police are here to protect and serve. So in this protect and serve, except in Ferguson, they looked at that black population as revenue generators. So you're doing 26 and a 25, boom, ticket. I don't think you fully stopped at that stop sign. Boom, ticket. Ah, looks like you've got a broken tail light. Boom, ticket. And this is a working class neighborhood. And so when you start hitting this neighborhood, this community with $50 tickets, $25 tickets, $80 tickets, $100 tickets, and you begin to think about what that means. You pay the ticket or you pay your rent. You pay the ticket or you keep food on the table. You keep the lights on. There's not disposable income here. When you don't pay that ticket, the next time you're doing 26 and a 25, because now there's a warrant out for your arrest then you are jailed. And then the entire criminal justice process of fines and court fees and bail are all pulling from this working class black community. By the time when Ferguson blew, those fines and those tickets accounted for 25% of Ferguson's operating budget. 25 percent. And let me be really clear, justice was not blind. Justice, in fact, had, what did you call it? Had Lasix. Because <laughs> justice was, so if the police would happen to stop somebody white and try to hand them a ticket and go, ooh, ooh, sorry, sorry, not you. Or if the police officer handed somebody white a ticket and somebody white went in to go then pay the ticket, it was like, what are you doing? I'm trying to pay this ticket and to tear up the ticket. So you're getting this massive extraction from the working class black population in Ferguson. Kindling. And so as I began to think about this kindling, I began to think about the way that white rage worked. White rage is not about visible violence. We often think of rage as visible. We often think of the racism as this visible thing. But white rage is subtle. It is corrosive. 
it operates through the state legislatures, through Congress, through the judiciary, through school boards. It cloaks itself in legalities. And so I set out, man, so because it's so quiet, it's so subtle, you don't see it. And so I set out to blow graphite onto that fingerprint, to be able to trace white rage throughout time, not all the way back to time immemorial with the dinosaurs, <laughs> but at least up to the Civil War all the way through to 2016. And one of the things that became clear to me as I started thinking through how white rage works, it became clear to me that the presence of black people was not the trigger for white rage. Huh? There's that stun, almost what you talking about Willis, look. <laughs> it is the presence of black people with ambition. The presence of black people with drive the presence of black people with aspirations, the presence of black people who achieve. It's the presence of black people who refuse to accept their subjugation, the presence of black people who demand their rights. That's the trigger for white rage. And this society has therefore punished black resilience and black resolve. Now, at this point, this sounds like hur, hur, hur. I'm a Scooby-Doo-ish, right? <laughs> because we know it's so counterintuitive because we think of the U.S., America, as the land of opportunity, right? And so all you've got to do is work hard, work hard. yes. And I'm telling you, y'all know the hymn. <laughs> right? So, so my baritone's here. <laughs> right? We know the hymn. We don't even have to pull out the book. It is in the ether. It's in the cultural language that we understand how this nation works. But so what happens if you have a series of policies that in fact punish black achievement, black aspiration? And it sounds counterintuitive, but how else can you explain how government after government after government has worked so hard to see to it that black children do not get a quality <laughs> education? Let me give you a couple of examples. In 1947, in Prince Edward County, Virginia, the school board finally agreed to build a high school for the black children. Because remember, this is a completely segregated system. Jim Crow. And so in 47, that would be after the US helped defeat the Nazis. I need to put that in its time frame. Then we get a high school for black children in Prince Edward County. Within a few years, that school is bursting at the seams. Two to three times as many children are in this space than that building can hold. And so the black parents are going to the school board, the all white school board saying, we need an additional school. We've got kids bursting at the seam. It's doggone near impossible for them to learn sitting one on top of the other like that. We need a new building. The school board was like, no. And the parents are pushing hard, unrelenting, demanding education for their children. And the school board finally relented and put up three tar paper shacks and said, your kids can go there. Now, meanwhile, the white school is nice brick with indoor plumbing, which is not available in the black high school. In 19, by this time, we're in 1951. So there was a, a, a young woman, Barbara John, 17, and Barbara Johns was like, my name is the wrong one. <laughs> you gonna take this? You gonna take this? No, you're not taking this. You gonna take this? Yeah, you're like, no, we gonna walk on out of here, aren't we? And she starts organizing that school for a massive walkout, a massive demonstration, saying, we're not having this. 
We're not having it. They rose up and boom, hit the door. Administrators were like, what, what does happen here? And they were like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Now it was, she wasn't playing. And so the death threats started coming in on this 17 year old child who was demanding quality education. It was so bad that her parents had to spirit her away to safety, to Alabama. <laughs> Boom, I rest my case. <laughs> you know when you got to go to Alabama for safety in 1951. <laughs> Woo! Woo! Meanwhile, Prince Edward County becomes one of the school districts that's bundled into the Brown case. Now, when Brown came down, Prince Edward County said, oh, I got something real for you. And so what the town fathers working with the state legislature decided to do was to shut down the entire public school system. Because that way, if we've got to have equal schools, then black children and white children equally do not have access to a public school. <laughs> and you can almost hear the, aren't I smart <laughs> written on them. Except, you know, so black parents are like, what? But they're not listening to black parents. White parents are like, what? And they're like, oh, no, 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 we got this. You know we're not gonna let your white babies go, you know, go uneducated, you know that. And so what they have done is that they have set up taxpayer funded vouchers to pay for the tuition for white children to go to all white segregated private academies. So white children continue to be educated and there is absolutely nothing for black children, thousands upon thousands of black children. And it wasn't just in Prince Edward County, this was in areas throughout the South. And when these schools are shut down, let me Prince Edward County is shut down for five years. Begin to think about that. You're in the fifth grade. When your school opens up again, you're supposed to be in the 10th. Think about everything that you have lost in those precious five years. And this is at that moment where the U.S. economy is beginning to transform from a manufacturing-based economy to a technology-driven, knowledge-based economy. And we have all of these black children that the governments and the school boards have said will not be educated, period. Oh, and I'm so happy about our uh, professor. She has come out and teach us a lot of things that it is happening, that it was happening uh, in the United States about the black people. And for me, I can say that the black Americans, they have been oppressed for a very long time. These people, they need to stop this uh, oppressing the black people. I want to tell you that you have seen what it is happening in the UK. The UK, they are coming out on the street. They are protesting. They want to kick the black immigrant out of their country. They are saying that we want our country back. They have come out and see the black people, the black immigrants, they are becoming more successful than them in their own country. They have come out and see the black immigrants, they are having more jobs than them in their own country. These people, they are now want to kick black immigrants in their own country because the black immigrants, they are having more opportunity and more privilege than them in their own country. So they are coming out and kicking out the black migrant. For me, I always tell you that what goes around comes around. For you, UK, the British people, you have been going around all over the world colonizing some of the uh, country. You have going around colonizing the Africa, the countries from the Caribbean. You came and took their treasures thing. You have kept them in your museum 
and you are charging the black people to to pay so that they can come and see what the the treasures things which belongs to them you people you came in africa you came in the black nations country you divided africa you you impacted you came and teach africans that the you people you need you don't you, you the race to love it is the white race not a black race so you people you colonize africa some of the african people they went through forced slavery you took our brothers and sisters all the way from here in africa to the uk in america and yet when they are becoming successful in your own country you are starting complaining you have designed the system in the united states to oppress black people this our our our, our professor she has come out and say whenever any small mistake that the black people the black person committed in you in united states you always ready to give them the ticket a fine a penalty so that he or she can pay immediately this fine when a black person he has imagine a black person he's driving and he has gone he has uh, and he has stop on the stop sign immediately you people you can come and give him a ticket him or her a ticket to pay because you are telling him that you have not uh, stopped as the how it was supposed to stop while when you see this pa this person the the black person his or her car it has having a small problem maybe a tar a light it doesn't work you are coming out and giving him a ticket so that he can pay the fine because only of one tar it is not working so you people you have made the black people the black americans in the united states to be as a source of revenue the black people they cannot succeed in united states because you people you have made them to be as revenue collector any small mistake you have given them the ticket you are charging them any small thing you have all you are always ready to issue the ticket but when you guys you are committing this uh, this small mistake you are not ready to give out the ticket to your fellow white person you can communicate and leave them to go but when you see it is a black person you must be ready to give him or her the ticket this means that up to today black people they are still being oppressed black people they they don't want them to unite in united states and also our professor she has come out and say also this thing started ab the, about the in the schools the white people they didn't want the black children to learn in the same school you went ahead and built the black school and you made anything possible to see that the black school it is not performing very well than the white school and also you didn't want to teach the black children about their black history you wanted them to learn your the black the white history in the in their school i'm so happy to see this doctor this a uh, professor coming out and exposing this white rage in united states and for me i always tell you my black americans or the black immigrants wherever you are in this foreigners country in this colonizers country wherever you are facing any fa any discrimination any racist you need to come out and expose we are tired of sitting down seeing these people taking advantage of us black people we are tired seeing these people teaching us about their history we as black people also we want to teach our children about black history and also this black this black professor she has said that every black person every black people known united states as the country of opportunity as the country where he or she can be able to grow faster but you are forgetting that united states it was designed for you people to work 
it is a uh, it was designed as as the colonizers as the plantation farm whereby it is very easy for you to achieve the things that you want to achieve but you will work for it even if after you have achieved this thing you will need to work for it so that you can maintain it so that you can have it for a long a long period it will you will need to work and that's how it, it the system united states has designed so you black people even if you are having this american dream just know that in united states everything you will need to work for it and the black people for you to make it also you will need to work for you need to work very hard in the united states so kindly guys i want to leave from there and i hope you guys who have learned a lot from this video and also remember to like this video so that it can reach to a lot of people a lot of black people also a lot of white people who are interested uh, seeing this black history or seeing their country being exposed you can also like this video and subscribe thank you so much guys see you on my next